for 2022. Otherwise, they don't see our growth attaining 4.2, but they still see a growth of 2.5% mm. from 2.4%. Isn't, isn't it logical that we, as Nigeria, we wear the shoe, we know where it pinches. We, as Nigeria, we know how our economy is, we know how our, we, our internal issues and whatnot. What. Shouldn't we be in the right position to see, okay, this is the way our economy is going to go? This is the projection that we have? Absolutely, Ibrahim, you are correct. Yeah. And that's why I took a little time to explain how the World Bank works. Yeah. Why it's a nine countries, Nigeria is part of it. So they meet annually uh, through our Ministry of Minister of Finance. Which, uh, which is also, who is also a member. And when they meet in that annual general meeting, there's World Bank and there's IMF. Mm. These two institutions are called Bertie institutions, started in 1945 after the Second World War, trying to rebuild. So another name for the World Bank is International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. And they give loans to countries to implement capital projects. So looking at our domestic economy, I assure you that we have Nigerians, we have Africans, just like I talked, mentioned earlier, our Minister of Finance being part of the meeting. So they see all those projections as well. It's not that the World Bank just sits in their office in Bretton Woods or in Washington and work out these figures. We, we are economists. We are friends. We are sometimes, we will serve as consultants to some of these analysis mm. to give market feedback. Mm. It's just like you and I sitting in Abuja, but we can analyze perfectly what's happening somewhere in Brunei right now mm -hmm. because we have reporters all over. So that's how the World Bank is. It aggregates data. Mm. The only thing is that many development partners civil society organizations, mm -hmm. and even many economists on the radical left, because economics too, our, we always argue, you know, mm -hmm. on the role, on the positive role of World Bank. Some people see the activities of World Bank as being damaging to economists. Exactly. But personally, I see the World Bank and IMF mm -hmm. as institutions that are partners for progress. So mm -hmm. when they throw their advice, we should pick it and throw it in our decision box. Mm -hmm. We're not saying we should take their decision 100%, but mm -hmm. we shouldn't ignore. And why they put our growth low, Ibrahim, just like you said, they are aware that our debt is rising. Mm -hmm. and, very, and debt servicing is almost competing with capital projects. Mm -hmm. If you now work out the ratio of debt to revenue, it will be very difficult. And don't forget their mandate. They give out loans to countries for capital projects. Mm -hmm. The way they see our loan, our debt building up, especially from components they don't understand, like the loan component from China and things like that, they fear that in the long run they may not even be able to to fund our borrowing for, for, for capital projects. Even if they do, they fear our ability to pay back. Don't forget, Nigeria used to be a low classified as a low income country. Mm -hmm. We have moved to a middle income country. Mm -hmm. So you, you become more harsher as your child grow up mm -hmm. so that the person will learn how to take responsibility. So it's our economy. We know where this shoe pinches, mm -hmm. but we should listen to advice. Just like our parents talked to us before we got married, you know, to, okay. to be careful. <laughs> now, yeah. the World Bank also projected accelerated growth in telecommunications and financial services. Uh, would you say we are on the path to achieving that presently? Yeah, thank you, Zainab. Um, financial services telecoms are major drivers of our current economic growth because of the, uh, the ability to, to leverage on the digital economy space. You know, even in 2020, when there was lock, global lockdown, COVID-19 shutdown, things like that, ICT was a sector that helped many sectors to grow. Any sector that was connected to ICT, telecoms, digital space, was able to maintain its growth. So, the, so just like the report pointed out, so that is a signal that if we want to help other sectors grow and remain on a positive trajectory, we must continue to um, sustain the telecom sector and financial services. But again, if these two sectors are driving growth, then we must find a way to connect other economies to it. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy that the government has finally reopened Twitter. Because one way for uh, Nigerians to benefit from businesses through telecom is by allowing them to have access to their digital space for businesses and then ensuring that we step up our efforts on financial inclusion so that, so that nobody will be left out mm -hmm. and so that our social investment programs can target low-income households very well using the financial sector. One thing is that even as we're innovating across our financial sector or across our financial space, it's important to do all those innovations through commercial banks. Otherwise, anything we are doing outside commercial banks will be frustrating CBN's ability to maintain price stability and ensure a healthy and stable financial system. All right, so all these projections that we're actually making, all these economic projections, both the one made by the World Bank and, of course, the one made here in Nigeria, they're, they're all tied to oil price, most of them, you understand. So. And um, we, we look at the current situation and then we try to see how the trajectory goes and then we make these projections. But what happens in a situation whereby those oil prices that we've hinged these projections on crash? Then what do we do? Great question, Ibrahim. So that's why the Ministry of Finance, through the Budget Office of the Federation, mm. representing the executive, works with the National Assembly, the legislature, 
to ensure that the appropriation act or the annual fiscal plan of the government, which is the budget, mm -hmm. is premised on key assumptions. Currently, crude oil price is doing above 84, piece, 84 uh, yes. dollar per barrel. And IMF even projects that crude oil price for 2022 may stay at 74. But if you look at the 2022 Appropriation Act, mm -hmm. the crude oil price used for Nigeria's budget is 62. In case there's a drop, so, but your, your, your question is still on point because if it drops below, below 62, 62. Exactly. they will be having a serious issue of fiscal crunch. So the, the, the concept of economic planning, especially on the fiscal side, mm -hmm. is to choose a crude oil price benchmark that by and large, having taken into consideration all the fluctuation and volatility in the international crude oil price market, mm -hmm. it will not go below that 62. So why the price is above that 62, mm -hmm. there's need for saving the excess revenue from crude oil earnings. So that should in case it goes below, mm -hmm. we'll draw up that savings and cover the gap between the, um, um, between the actual price and the budget benchmark price. Then while we are doing all that, it's important to strengthen our economic reform to jack up or to, uh, to, to be able to jack up or raise or shore up revenue from federal independent revenue, mm -hmm. internal generated revenue of 36 states and 774 local government plus the area councils in Lagos. You know, generally, because the crude oil price will always be, uh, will be dependent on vo um, international volatility in the crude oil, crude oil market. But the one we can be sure of is our internally generated revenue, revenue that, we are sh that, that is coming from our own domestic um, production, industries, firms, entrepreneurs. So it's important to continue to keep an eye on oil price because we need crude oil price still, crude oil revenue to, to even diversify our economy. But it's important to move away from depending solely on crude oil to domestic, just like Lagos is doing. If you look at Lagos, the component of Lagos State revenue, L revenue from Lagos Inland Revenue Service and Lagos State Inland, Lagos State Internal Generated Revenue account for 77% of Lagos State revenue. The contribution from the federal government to Lagos is about 18%. So in case there's a shock to Lagos State, for example, from federal government, Lagos State can still survive. The same thing applies to our country. We must do our best to raise the non-oil component of our revenue so that in case there's a shock from crude oil price, we can still survive. And support for Nexin Bank to ensure that we we expand the capacity of our non-oil export to also end the way crude oil prices earning. It's okay. also very important. Okay, so Dr. Tefa, we're going to get quickly back to that and look at other perspect perspectives, you know, on the economy after this quick timeout. Federal Capital Territory. The area council elections will be conducted on Saturday, February 12th, 2022. This is an opportunity for you to vote for the candidate of your choice for the positions of chairman and councillors of the area councils. Elections will take place in all six area councils of Amak, Abaji, Kwali, Gwagwalada, Kuje, and Buari. The FCT administration is working closely with INEC to ensure that the elections are conducted in a free and fair atmosphere. Are you a supporter of any of the candidates in the elections? Avoid showing your support through toggery and violent behavior. All candidates contesting various positions should remember that only God gives power. Elections should therefore not be seen as a do-or-die affair. We must shun any form of violence, malpractices, vote buying, ballot box snatching, or anything that will make the election unfair. Be patriotic. Perform your civic duties. Vote for the candidate of your choice in a peaceful and orderly manner. Let all electorates exercise their franchise without intimidation. Voting is your right. Use it wisely. This message is from the FCT administration.
on Trust TV. Well, we're still talking um, the economy and we have Dr. Tefa Abraham right here in the studio. We're talking about economic projections and what we have in store for 2022. So before we went on that break, we were actually talking about oil prices and how they affect, affect all these projections. And we, you made mention of how when we do the projections, we actually give some leeway, some breathing space, just in case the oil price falls below a certain level. So just like you said, so, um, the, the projections some of them were based on $62 per barrel. Mm. But if COVID-19 taught us something, is that unprecedented things can actually happen. At one point during the height of COVID-19, oil price was like zero. So what happens now if we've made these projections that it's going to, not going to fall below $62 per barrel and then it falls down to like 15 or 10? How do we... How, how do we re rearrange ourselves, so to speak? Yeah, great, great question. Already, well, um, don't forget 2022, 2021 Appropriation Act was premised on $40 per barrel. Okay. And crude oil price is currently doing more than that amount. So it's important to save excess earnings on the crude oil price benchmark when the prices are doing well. Because it might happen that the price will go below, just like you rightly said that COVID-19 taught us. For, the, for 2022, the Federal Ministry of Finance used, premised our crude oil price on $57 per barrel. But changes in prices in the international crude oil market space informed the National Assembly to raise it to 62. Mm. And if you look at the current price, it's above 84. So it, 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 it it is still within tolerable rate. The key point there is that we should do our best to save mm. the excess that, is, that we haven't getting today. Because crude oil sales is on a daily basis. When we pro, the, for 2022, we project, 2021 rather, we projected that we'll be able to sell 1.88 million barrel per day. Mm. By November, we were doing 1.7 million barrel per day. Mm. So as, at, as of yesterday, 1.7 million barrel per day on the average must have been sold. So saving the excess from the difference mm. is very critical. And the legislative framework to ensure that the executive arm of government adhere to that saving is on a savings is what is on that thing that we need to push forward for. Like the National Assembly can come in by ensuring that we actually have in place an excess crude account, a legislation for the excess crude account. It's possible to have it. Mm. But if there's no legislation, it will just be left to the um, prerogative of executive will, ensuring that the savings from excess crude is kept so that it can be drawn from when there's a negative shock. It's where it's, it's the point that's really critical to addressing that vital question you asked. Okay, one other thing you know that actually bothers me in this projection is still um, hampering on the COVID-19 variant Omicron. Uh, as it states, you know, in this projection. Uh, the threats from COVID-19 variants and rising inflation, debt and income inequality could endanger the recovery in emerging and developing economies. You know, for Nigeria, we are still a developing nation. And how, how, how are we going to survive this? The World Bank 2022 report already reduced the global growth rate from about 6 to 5 and for advanced economies from about 5 to 3. Where there's growth is in low income and emerging economies, mm. including Nigeria, mm. with the World Bank project, project that to grow from 2.4% mm -hmm. to 2.5%. So for low, um, for low developing and emerging economies, there's still, there's still prospect for growth. Mm. That report is only calling our attention to the fact that if the COVID-19 threat is not curtailed through effective global management and all countries mm. putting their hands on deck mm. to ensure that vaccination is adhered to, mm -hmm. and COVID-19 is just kept low from spreading. Mm -hmm. Our partners that we're looking forward to getting foreign direct investment from may not be forthcoming. Our export may also not have the needed market. So even though our own economy is not hit directly by, uh, by high debt rates, thank God for that, mm -hmm by COVID-19 and its many variants. Mm. We are still connected in a global economy through trade and um, investment. Mm. So it's important to still keep an eye on, de on developments and events around COVID-19 and its variants and possibility of expanding. So what we can do from that knowledge is ensuring that we remain careful 
to COVID-19 protocols. Mm. This tiny advice from NCDC mm -hmm. and World Health Organization and the federal government in general mm -hmm. to adhere to COVID-19 protocol is important because COVID adhering to the COVID-19 protocol now and scaling up vaccination rate mm -hmm. has become a new investment signal for future investment. Right. Nobody wants to take his um, investment to a country that the investors are not sure of going back. Mm -hmm. Another thing we need to look at is insecurity because the way our insecurity is going right now, global investors are seeing our economy as a fragile state mm. or as, an, as a fragile economy. All these regional geopolitical tensions as well, they are all bad for investment. So it's important to ensure that whatever protest North Central has, North East, North West, South East, South South, South East have, it's important to do it within tolerable rates to ensure that it gives room for dialogue. Violence um, protests, very strong violent protests. We just turn back investment, even from the local government that the that, that the world that Nigeria's billionaire uh, richest men come from. Mm -hmm. So it's important to ensure that, just like Ibrahim asked earlier and mm -hmm. uh, said earlier, it's our country. We know where it pinches. Right. So however we are doing our protests or disagreement, let us keep it civil so that investment can still go on. Uh, situations where you destroy people's investment because of protests. It will take time for them to recover. And the few people they've been able to employ, they have to lay them off. These are the tiny things that add to slowing economic growth. Just this week, the uh, survey, 2020, the survey for medium and small scale enterprises came out. And it shows that that sector contributes about 3.7% to our GDP growth. So if we do support small scale businesses, mm -hmm. that woman who sells rice at Karakose on the road to remain open will be affecting their means of livelihood, thereby worsening our poverty situation. So the concept there is that mm -hmm. it's important to ensure that we curtail every risk, external and domestic, which includes COVID-19 mm -hmm. and its many variants, by just ensuring that we tame them by complying. Okay, uh, now we're still trying to connect with the Managing Director, Afri Invest Securities Limited, Aoudeji Ebo. Uh, he, if he's able to join us, we'll continue the discussion with him, but we'll still be here with Dr. Tefa Abraham. Now, as all these projections come through, where will the issue of food inflation stand? Food inflation is one direct link from our macroeconomic analysis variables to how it affects the everyday Nigerian. And even though our inflation rate has maintained its decline from March 2021 to date, as of, as of March, our inflation rose to about 18%. It is on the decline. Mm. But presently, it's doing, it's around 15.44%. The key point is that it's declining, yes, but it's still double digit inflation. Double digit inflation is bad for investment, bad for food prices, bad for anything. Double digit inflation of 15.44% plus unemployment rate of 33%. That's about 58.4% misery index. Youth unemployment is even worse, about 40 to 44%. 40 percent plus 15, we are looking at youth unemployment about 60 something percent, meaning 10 out of, out of every 10 young people in Nigeria, including boys and girls, six may not have jobs. Now, food inflation, agriculture is still major, um, the major source of agriculture of food supply is from rural markets, mm. from villages, from communities, from wards. And the, uh, the ability to maintain, to farm sustainably mm. has not been that possible in the last three to four years because of insecurity at a point. Um, terrorists, as they've been termed now, mm. even forced fa farmers to pay something to them before they harvest. So all these things affect the supply of food to the, to the city. Mm -hmm. And once the supply of food is less than the supply of demand, food prices will go up, in addition to the existing double-digit inflation. And, and rural farmers, who are mostly smallholder women farmers, are also wise now, true extension workers. If it costs them a lot to move their harvest from farm to market because of bad road that they have to grapple with, mm -hmm. they will also factor in the cost of that transporting their goods into, uh, into the price of the, the good, the food they are bringing to the market. Mm. And also, they are aware of the periods that we demand for food the most. So what they do is that they try to average the supply of their goods by ensuring that they are able to sell when the, when, when the demand for goods will be higher than the supply, so that they can also be able to sustain their livelihood, take their children to good schools, pay for health care, mm. and afford the everyday necessities of life. So for food inflation, the government has to do a lot 
to ensure that in the market, when you and I go to buy these goods, we see government policy, as we, as we say, in, um, as we report in economic analysis, mm -hmm. affecting the price of goods. But what the sellers do, in the, the final seller of goods and farm harvest in the market, what they do is that, don't forget, they've already stocked rice, for instance, since mm -hmm. February, since mm -hmm. March. Mm -hmm. They are also buying rice in bags today. But when you, you and I go to buy, they will sell the old one first before the new one. Mm -hmm. And they'll sell the old one at the old price. So for the agricultural sector, because our economy is, still, is, is not yet a very smooth economy that demand and supply forces work smoothly, mm -hmm. there's need for price regulation. The way government, I always push this point, the way government does with Department of Petroleum Resources by ensuring that um, um, fi um, filling stations don't sell above the current Some price, price. Mm. or they don't adjust their scale mm. to the detriment of the of of, of yeah. people buying mm. government needs to do the same thing with food prices mm. they need to be a food price intelligence unit from mm. the federal ministry of agriculture mm. to ensure that when they go they conduct um, periodic assessment. assessment or monitoring of mm. markets mm. to ensure that prices of goods are sold or for food is sold at the appropriate price they need to be deliberate um, um, effort to ensure that that is the situation. But generally speaking, food inflation is something that is still terrible. And like I said, because of the, num the existing inflation mm -hmm. and challenges of insecurity and farm harvest, bad road in um, farm to market uh, road infrastructure mm -hmm. and the likes. Right, so quickly now, before we go, um, in, in just 60 seconds, there's this word that we've been hearing, I have been hearing since I didn't know what it was till I got to know what it is, what it means. Diversification. We've been shouting this mantra, we need to diversify economy, leave oil, do this, do that. Where are we on diversification? Nigeria's story with diversification is a long one. Exactly. You and I, and I'm sure even my parents <laughs> since <laughs> secondary school have been hearing this diversification. Yeah. But don't forget, if we take a stock of diversification story from 30 years ago, that time there's no telecoms. Mm. Mm. From 20 years ago, that time, no expanded banking service. Mm. Mm. From 10 years ago, mm. that time, agriculture is still largely mm. a rural business. Five years ago, so the idea is that diversification is slow. But if you take a stock of our con uh, economic history, mm. we've made slow but steady progress. Mm. But the full mean of the, and the diversification again, 20 years ago, Nollywood was not this big. Mm. Ten years ago, the music industry wasn't this big. Mm. Five years ago, it wasn't possible for comedians and all those people in art and f mm. entertainment to be this popular the way they are now. Uh, interior decoration was not a big deal many years back. Mm. To be an ICT expert was not a big, years, mm -hmm. big, thing, big deal many years back. So this is how you take a stock on diversification. But for us generally, when we, the one area that has not benefited from the diversification story is manufacturing. Textile factories still down, manufacturing still not doing well. Mm. And if you look at our country's national development plan, these are part of these are some of the areas that the country's national development plan is still mm. looking forward at recording very beautiful goals from 2021 to 2025. Well, thank you so much thank for you. Thank you coming Zena. on the program, thank you, Dr. Tefo Abraham. He is an economist and governing council member, Nigerian Economic Society. We hope to have you next time as usual. Looking forward. Thank you. Okay, it's now time to take a look at Business Roundup with Chairman Dabeng. Do stay. Federal government has deducted the number and duration of trips made abroad by ministers and other categories of government officials and other special allowances as it is set to cut costs to achieve fiscal prudence. Director of Information Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation, Willie Bassi, in a statement said the President, Mohamedou Buhari, will also cut down the number of persons permitted to travel with ministers and other government officials for official trips. Moving forward, all ministries, departments and agencies are required Required to submit their yearly travel plans for statutory meetings and engagements to the Office of the Secretary to the Government of the Federation and or the Office of the Head of Civil Service of the Federation for express clearance within the first quarter of the fiscal year before implementation. In addition, only trips beneficial to the country must be embarked upon by the effective by a long goal. A penalty converted by Ibrahim Akune in the 48 minutes lifts the Eagles of Mali over Tunisia. The Carthage Eagles of Tunisia had a tough match against the Eagles of Mali as both teams were equal to the task. 
The first red card in the competition issued to El Bilal Toure in the 87th minute got loss of reactions on Zambian referee Jani Zikazwe. Zikazwe ends the match at 89 minutes to the amazement of Tunisia officials who protested against the decision after he had earlier ends the game in the 85th minute in a dramatic encounter. In the second match, play in Group F between Mauritania and Gambia as Stadio Omni Sport the Limbe. Abli Jalo puts Gambia ahead of Mauritania in the 10th minute in the score line that stood till end as Gambia celebrates win over Mauritania. Niger Tornadoes of Mina have been sanctioned to play their home matches in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, and also fined 5.5 million Naira by the league management company, LMC. In a decision about match officials' assault and insecurity during Niger Tornado's Rivers United clash in Ilorin, LMC sanctioned Tornado's for breach of MPFL rules and framework in the course of the match. Niger Tornado's and two of their officials have been sanctioned just as LMC requested the Nigerian Referee's Appointment Committee to review the performance of the centre referee in the match day five fixture. Tornado's are to play their next three home matches at the MK Wabiola Stadium in Abuja and a suspended two points deduction. Uman Farouk, chief coach of Niger Tornado's, charged for assault on referee when he struck a blow to referee's head. LMC expelled Farouk from all MPFL organized activities with immediate effect with the review of his coaching license by the Nigerian Football Federation NFF as he is deemed to have failed the threshold to be a coach. In basketball, Federal Capital Territory Abuja will host 16 teams that will jostle for honors as Mark the Ball Championship kicks off. Competition organizers announced 16 teams for the basketball tournament. Local organizing committee secretary Umar Abdullahi says 16 teams have been picked to participate in Mark the Ball Championship after a long wait of no tournament. Air Warriors, First Bank, Sunshine Angels, Novena Queens, Kada Angels, Benway Princess and Plateau Rocks are part of the team selected for the championship. Others are FCT Rocks, IGP Queens, Taraba Hurricanes, Nasarawa Amazons, and many more. Mark the Ball Basketball Championship will dunk off at the Indoor Sports Hall of MK Wabola Stadium on January 15, 2022. Made in Nigerian blind powerlifting and bench press trials holding at the National Stadium through Lily Lagos is having 150 blind powerlifters drawn across Nigeria. Coordinator Barista Silva Ezekwe says first of its kind trials in Nigeria is aimed at selecting the lifters that will represent the country at the forthcoming fourth IBSA powerlifting and bench press World Cup and second African Continental Powerlifting and Bench Press Championships holding between March 22nd and 29th, 2022 in Alexandra, Egypt. That's Sport News. I am Adeni Ajishafe. Well, very, very interesting. You know, one thing that actually caught my attention in that sports um, roundup is the um, blind uh, powerlifting. weightlifting, yeah, powerlifting, yes. they call it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and you know, it's very, it's very nice when you see Paralympians actually getting over their disabilities mm -hmm. to, to, to participate in sporting activities like this. It really gives you um, a lot of uh, hope for, 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 for Nigerian sports. You know, I really think that uh, the sporting world has really given people with disabilities that space to thrive. and. I really do hope that other fields, you know, can actually give them more opportunities exactly. like this to even forget about their disabilities. Exactly. They have their own Olympics. I mean, like, so it's, it's fantastic for them. Mm. Well, with that, we wrap up Daybreak on Trusted Television. It's been quite interesting. We've talked economy uh, and other issues here on the program this morning. And we hope to see you tomorrow for another exciting package of Daybreak. My name is Zainab Bala. And I am Ibrahim Yusuf. Let's do this again tomorrow.